Good morning. <clears throat> Past week, I've been spending uh, some time deciding what I was going to talk about today and what I want to study next. And um, this was after you know our time with the ox herding pictures for five weeks, five Sundays. And I, I definitely had some ideas that were speaking to me and just letting those percolate a bit. But you know, these teachings, these ox herding pictures and the accompanying poems just were really still very much alive in me. And so I just looked more closely at that and I felt there were some some concepts um, that I didn't really, I wasn't really let, ready to let go of yet, wanted to talk a little bit more about. So the origin of, of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, focused, or that's the origin of that, and I'm focusing on a couple of things that I just felt I wanted to give some more space to. Um, you know, the ox herding pictures and the poems all have at their center uh, the seeker, us, each of us. And also, of course, the ox herd or enlightenment, the ox. In fact, the word enlightenment is integral to our discussions of these important drawings and words, so much so that it can perhaps be taken to mean that we wish we, you know, we wish we were striving for it, searching for it, or trying to attain it. And when we attain it, whatever that might be, it may seem that we've somehow arrived somewhere, that we've accomplished something. But in fact, that is not how enlightenment is viewed in Zen. In Zen, enlightenment is actually the inherent nature of all beings. It is not a unique, special quality that only some people possess or can achieve. And because enlightenment is already present within all beings, we are all capable of realizing it. And the realizing of it is the path. However, as we no doubt have experienced, we're not always aware of our awakened nature because our minds are very often clouded and unclear and hampered by all kinds of things, often referred to as impurities, if you will, strong word. But as an example, in Zen, we talk about the three poisons of greed, anger, and delusion. So in Zen teachings, we learn that ordinary mind is the way. In other words, the enlightened mind that understands the true nature of existence and the clouded ordinary mind that gets angry at bad drivers, those two are actually the same. Zen practices like Zazen, sitting meditation, are meant to help us clear our minds by recognizing these challenges, these thoughts, these feelings that might get stuck in us and then finding ways to let them go. Our continued practice with the help of our teacher, if we have one, can lead us to experience the enlightenment that has always been with us and within us. But in reality, our teachers don't talk to us much about enlightenment, or, or maybe hardly even use the word, likely because giving us ideas about it, talking about it, doesn't help us realize it. Our honest practice does that. In Zen, we use the word kensho, meaning seeing one's true nature. And it's only through our own experience our own opening to the true nature of the self, that we can realize it. The 10 ox herding pictures we have been studying express this journey, in my opinion, very poignantly and clearly. And right through the 10th picture called Entering the Marketplace, I think you probably all remember that, going back into the world. In that picture, we see an enlightened spiritual being who is manifesting in the world for the benefit of others, wizened and free of all encumbrances, delusions and ego, having realized emptiness, a, con a concept so central to Zen Buddhism and Buddhism in general. 
And while well, Kensho is certainly a significant milestone on the path, we understand that the process of awakening goes on forever. We have discovered, all of us, that there is always something to look at, to study, to clarify. We're on a lifelong commitment to waking up to our true nature. I had briefly mentioned at some point in the last three weeks, in the last weeks rather, that there was there was some, um, or has been historical debate in Zen about the nature of awakening. And there are those who throughout history believe that awakening is a gradual process, happening only after many years of practice. And there are those who believe that it happened just like that. And I was happy to learn quite a while ago that over time, the Zen community came to realize that both are possible. It's my understanding that all schools in Zen today believe in moments of sudden enlightenment, which actually means the enlightened mind is already present. And just think of the Buddha's words upon his own awakening, which he said, I, all beings, and the great earth have at once entered the way, meaning we are all together awakened. And that realization of this enlightened mind may come to a, any of us in an instant. These moments of awakening then must be deepened after we've had them. They must be integrated into further practice. And it's here that our teachers, if we have one or two, can help guide us. So this concept in Zen is known as sudden enlightenment and gradual cultivation. Since you began practicing Buddhism and Zen in particular, I think you no doubt have a feeling about this. Maybe we don't need to name it gradual enlightenment, but I think we all have had a sense of gradual awakening to our own minds, to our own ego, to our practice of Zazen. And maybe it's finally noticing a hurtful habit or a hurtful habitual response aimed at someone we care about. Perhaps unlike before our practice, now we can see this behavior more clearly. We can recognize it more clearly. We can see that we are clinging to something that we need to look more closely at. This is what our practice can do for us. We're growing. Additionally, maybe we have become more able to just be present in that really important gap between input and response. In Zen, we call this taking the backward step. There are many, many changes that we probably can feel and sense and see as a result of our years of practice. And we actually don't need to call these anything. We don't need to call them gradual or sudden enlightenment. We can just look at them and let them support our trust in this practice, our willingness to keep going endlessly. Dogen, Dogen Zenji, um, Soto Zen's founding teacher, back in the 13th century, lived in the 13th century, uh, when emphasizing that enlightenment is already present in all of us, discouraged his students from thinking of enlightenment as a goal. And why, you might ask? And he said, because striving toward a goal reinforces the illusion of a self, a self who might achieve the goal. Rather, he taught that practice and enlightenment are one activity. They're just one activity. He suggested to his students that instead of struggling to get it, to get something, just be still and let it unfold. And this we continue to do endlessly. The ox herding pictures highlight the important reality that our practice is our life, that our life is our practice. 
Norman Fisher Sensei has said that the, the hope for a practice in his, in his words is that we would get to the point where would be, there would be no gap at all between our deepest goodness and our most sacred aspirations and the way we come across and act in ordinary events every day. No matter how imperfectly we manifest it. And he's referring, I think here, to Dogen's writings on continuous practice. In other words, living our lives fully engaged with our whole hearts all the time. And I would like to just share with you a few of the sentences of the first paragraph of Dogen's essay on continuous practice. And this is a quote. So he writes, on the great road of Buddha ancestors, there is always unsurpassable, so not exceeded by anything else, unsurpassable practice continuous and sustained. It forms the circle of the way and it's never cut off. So between aspiration and practice and enlightenment and then eventually nirvana, there is not a moment's gap. Continuous practice is the circle of the way. You know, he offers two really important visuals here, I think. First, he explains that this is a road. This is a road that our ancestors walked upon. All of the great wise ones of the past who stepped onto this road and found the way to a true, open, honest life. And they stayed and they walked continuously throughout their lives. And interestingly, the road can also be experienced as a circle in that we are not really on our way to somewhere. We are simply and continuously walking the road of practice, a circular path where each step is leaving home and then returning home, never ending. No matter what we do or we don't do, no matter how we act or we don't act, we are always a part of this circle the totality of experience and life. And as Dogen then shared with us, between aspiration, practice, enlightenment, and nirvana, there is not a moment's gap. So what does this mean? We've actually talked about what brought us to this practice, all of us. Um, when, actually, when we first began our discussions of the Oxfording pictures, this aspiration that brought us to practice, why did we come? Is something quite precious, really. Because it's the beginning of this endless circular road that we're on. And then we just continue down the road on our practice, going forward and never turning back. And we can see ourselves here now. You know, and enlightenment happens. And eventually, maybe in Nirvana, but in a very beautiful way. Dogen explains that all of these stages happen at the same time. They all exist at the same time. So when we think about our original aspiration, which brought us to step on the road, on this road of Zen, even with our, our minds clouded and unclear and uncertain, the other three, practice enlightenment and nirvana, are already there. All of these stages happen at the same time. And this, he says, is continuous practice. Now, perhaps we are here together, quietly meditating on a Sunday morning, or maybe we're at a busy farmer's market, or out on a walk, or we're sitting with a grieving friend. We are told that if we enter each of these moments with full commitment and full letting go, that is aspiration, Practice, enlightenment, and nirvana all wrapped up in one. This practice is continuous and available, available at every single moment to us. 
continuous practice that we are a part of is life itself and death. This first paragraph of Dogen's essay ends with this, this quote. The power of this continuous practice confirms you as well as others. It means your practice affects the entire earth, the entire sky in 10 directions. Although not noticed by others, or maybe even by you, it is so. I think you'd agree that we could spend a lot of time on just this one paragraph. And perhaps we'll do that soon together. But for us now, we might think of our journey with the ox herding pictures as illuminating this road. This road that we have been walking together and continue to walk together. Illuminating our shared experiences, our common precious aspiration that ultimately brought us to practice together here. You know, our Zen practice isn't, it's not special. It's not something we've added on to our lives at some point, some adornment. It's our life. It's real life. And it is us living our lives fully and with our whole hearts. It's not always easy. You know, our practice then is just a way for us, a way to help us appreciate the fact that life is practice endlessly. It's an extension of the practice of our Buddhist ancestors. That can hold us up. Because of them, then, we are becoming who we have always been. And we can better actualize our vows that we say over and over again to relieve suffering. You know, we all know that in the world, there are a relatively small number of people committed to our practice. So even more important then is the place within our hearts, the place within us that knows continuous practice. Even if you're not sitting, except today with us, you still know this in your heart this continuous practice that Dogen speaks of. This place of refuge that supports us and supports all beings and all earth, supports the entire world. 